Eh, voy a ir presentando a los profesores mientras el profesor Williams cargue su, su presentación. Eh, nos acompañan en esta mesa dos de los grandes analistas académicos de temas de crimen organizado y narcotráfico. Eh, eh, y me es eh, un honor inmenso poder presentarlos. Eh, Bruce Bagley es eh, profesor de la Universidad de Miami, fue eh, uno de los supervisores de mi tesis doctoral, eh, un amigo de hace muchos años eh, que trabaja desde hace décadas temas de Colombia, como muchos saben, eh, nos va a hablar de, de nuevas dimensiones del nexo criminal político en América Latina, mirando el siglo XXI. El propósito de este panel, pues para recordarles, es pensar ya hacia futuro en las tendencias del crimen organizado para el 2019. Eh, voy a resumir su hoja de vida eh, de forma muy simple y desde memoria. Es autor de cientos de libros, artículos y publicaciones sobre temas relacionados con narcotráfico, Colombia, México, América Latina, seguridad. Eh, es una hoja de vida que difícilmente podríamos resumir eh, eh, en, en pocos minutos. Eh, eh, fue anteriormente profesor de SAIS de Johns Hopkins University, es colaborador frecuente de las universidades de los Andes y la Universidad ICC en Cali. Eh, veo que también ha colaborado extensamente con Flaxo Ecuador eh, y con el CIDE de México, entre muchas otras instituciones en América Latina. Eh, y eh, eh, en algunas de las iteraciones de su trabajo sobre crimen organizado y narcotráfico también ha ahondado, es de las pocas personas que piensa América Latina eh, desde el rol de la mafia rusa. Eh, ya el profesor Williams cargó su presentación. I'll bring you a translator in a sec. Eh, el profesor Williams nos va a hablar de tendencias globales del crimen organizado y por eso le voy a pedir a él hablar primero. Eh, tiene una hoja de vida igual de extensa al profesor Bruce Bagley. Eh, es de los analistas más reconocidos, yo creo que del mundo, en temas de crimen organizado. Cualquier persona que trabaja conceptualmente el crimen organizado obligatoriamente ha leído su obra. Eh, eh, los estudiantes que estudian este tema también consultan eh, los handbooks y las publicaciones de él en este tema. Eh, él es director del Centro Matthew eh, B. Ridge, Ridgeway de Estudios de Seguridad Internacional de la Universidad de Pittsburgh eh, y su investigación a lo largo de estas décadas se ha enfocado en el crimen organizado transnacional. Eh, entiendo que más recientemente, más allá de la conceptualización, ha ido mirando distintos continentes y el comportamiento del crimen organizado en estos, incluyendo el continente africano. Eh, ha sido también participante en distintos tipos de informe eh, internacional de entidades tales como Naciones Unidas. Eh, yo creo que ya estamos en familia, entonces voy a dejar de leer eh, para poder aprovechar eh, de, de este panel. Eh, luego presento a Jerry McDermott, pero voy a dar la palabra al profesor Williams para que eh, nos haga su presentación. ¿Es 15 minutos ok para ti? Ok. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Aline, for the invitation and to uh, Steve and uh, Jeremy. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So, the reason that I wanted to go first on this is because I'm going to do global trends. I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that I think have already been raised by Angelica, and uh, I, I think in that tour de force we just saw uh, from Federico. So, so, here's some assumptions, right? We're dealing with a globalized world, but one in which there's a backlash. Unfortunately, the backlash will actually make it's much more difficult to cooperate in combating organized crime. And I think we're already seeing that in the strain in which the US president is creating with lots of traditional allies. Uh, he, he, he seems to treat his allies uh, much worse than he treats traditional adversaries like Russia. Uh, it's also a world in which many, many states are perennially weak. I think very few have failed or collapsed. Bruce and I were talking a little bit about this a few minutes ago. Uh, but but many are perennially and perpetually weak. And I think that provides all sorts of things uh, for organized crime, all sorts of opportunities. And one of the things, it also means there are a few constraints. 
And I think a world in which there are multiple opportunities for organized crime uh, is a really dangerous world, right, in terms of, in terms of organized crime becoming more powerful. And or we, we try to constrain organized crime. We, we rarely think about reducing opportunities for organized crime. And I think they're two very different strategies. We try to create, create the behavior. We rarely think about what can we do about the underlying markets and how can we make sure there are less opportunities in those underlying markets. And actually, a couple of years ago, with, with Colin Clark, and who was then at Rand, is now at Carnegie Mellon, and Steve Davenport, we did a paper for the, intelligence, for the, for the National Intelligence Council uh, actually looking at the future of organized crime over the next five to ten years. And we came up, actually, with four worlds. And these are the four worlds. And what we did, we looked at about eight or nine drivers, like migration was one of them, uh, globalization, geopolitical conflict. Uh, we looked at these drivers and then said, do they strengthen states or do they strengthen organized crime? And we came up with kind of four worlds. The first one in which they strengthen organized crime and weaken states, we call criminal nirvana. The one where they both strengthened the top, the top, uh, the, the top left, the, as you look at it, uh, we, we call criminal confrontation, right? And, there was, and that's, that becomes who adapts best. And my colleague at Pitt, Michael Kenny, has done a great book called From Pablo to Osama, looking at how governments adapt to criminals, how criminals and terrorists adapt to, gov adapt to governments. Then we looked at two where, where essentially the opportunities were, were more constrained. And one was criminal recession, uh, where states were stronger and could keep organized crime in its place. But the other one, where states were also weak, but organized crime didn't have the opportunities, uh, we, we call criminal frustration. And, and I think what, we, what, I, what came out of this for me, looking at these drivers, looking at the impact on states, and this was at a very macro level, but looking at that, what came out was that opportunities are perhaps more important than we think, and we might want to think more about reducing opportunities and restricting opportunities than simply putting constraints on organizations. And I think that's one of the takeaways, I hope, that, that we think more about those. So some caveats, right? And I think, and Helica made many of these, some of these trends are already there. And, and the question then becomes, where are the tipping points? So for example, we've talked a lot about synthetics, but botanicals are still going strong. So what is the tipping point when we really start to see the replacement of botanical, botanical narcotics with synthetics? Uh, what about continuity and change? Again, Anne Helica uh, introduced it. And then what we found was that some of the drivers of change reinforce each other, but some offset. So for example, if you think about demographic change, we have in many developing countries still a, a, a youth bulge, in many developed countries aging populations, and that sets the scene for increased organ trafficking, right? Put all other things aside, but it does actually set the scene for increased organ trafficking. But you think about 3D printing, and you think about the capacity to print things like kidneys, which is, which is now available, that could offset it. So again, that's an, that's an offsetting one. Okay, so trend one, diversification, processes and strategies, and again, Angelica raised this a lot. Um, but I think one of the things you're seeing is organized crime becoming more diffused, more violent. It used to be in Mexico all about the drug business. Now it's all about other things, like gasoline, like kidnapping, like extortion. Uh, and we've seen also an increase in what I like to call the violence business. And the Zetas were in the violence business and many of the gangs that groups like uh, the, the, the Juarez Drug Trafficking Organization, I don't like cartels. These groups do not control price and production levels. Okay? I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, but groups, groups like the Juarez Cartel, they, 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 had, they had gangs that were working for them. And those gangs were in the violence business. And if you're a drug trafficker, you don't want too much violence, it gets in the way of your business. If you're in the violence business, you want the violence to continue and to increase, because then you, you actually make more money. The, the, other, the other element, I think, is that drug traffickers broaden to other illicit markets, and that goes back to the debate Federico and I had, because there are other markets where it's not just about production. Things already exist and they're stolen, diverted, or, in the, or there's a demand, as for human beings, who want to move from places where they have very little economic op opportunity, or they're repressed, or they face violence on a daily basis. And human smuggling organizations have come into being to 
meet those opportunities and to provide the services they demand. And then more recently, I think we've seen organised crime, organised crimes resource discovery. So far goes into illegal o o gold mining, Zetas get involved with uh, coal, mi coal mining at some points, and with, the, and with uh, basically siphoning off resources from Pemex. Uh, you have wildlife poaching, you have fish poaching. And one of my students, I'm doing some work with him on some of this, it's a very interesting thing that you get with these things, right? Illegal gold, fish being poached. What's the difference with the legal product? And I think that's something, they have dual status. Just as you have some, prob in the proliferation world, you have some things which are dual use, right? In this world, you now have the things which are dual status. They can be legal or illegal, and there's no obvious telling the difference. We tried to de deal with that in diamonds, with the, the Kimberley process, but we haven't got anywhere near dealing with it in things like fish or timber and other things like that. The other one, diffusion of knowledge, right? Knowledge is easy to diffuse over the internet, but also, uh, you actually see, we've had some very interesting cases of Mexicans, Colombians, Venezuelans go into West Africa and actually teaching seminars, getting paid for it, as it says there, teaching seminars on how to set up a meth lab and how to produce methamphetamine. That's the diffusion of knowledge. And what we've seen as a result of that is an increase in West African, particularly Nigerian, methamphetamine trafficking to East Asia. Third, Peter Lapsha, who's an old, Bruce will remember him, probably no one else will, but uh, because Bruce is older than, than I am. Uh, so, um, Peter Lapsha had this great comment about Mexico once. He said, the play has changed, but the game continues. I think this, is, this leads to a puzzle, right, in Central America. And Steve might have the best done since he's done a lot of work on this, Steve Dudley. Um, but the transportista families have been taken down. But it does, seems to have no impact on the drugs going through the region, right? The flow of cocaine. So are we seeing successor organizations? Or are these organizations that have been decapitated still operating? Um, or are the gangs becoming much more important in this, in this process? Okay? And then Lubshire also had this notion of, of groups going from predatory to parasitic to symbiotic. It's three stages of organized crime development. That might become irrelevant again. Trend for exploitation of technology. We already heard about fentanyl from China. Chemists have become criminals in China. People who can go and say, okay, these are all things that are regulated, but this product with a slight chemical change in it is not. I can produce that. So it's a fentanyl derivative, and it's still as powerful. Then you've got basically the, te the technological fight between the state and organized crime. On the one side, technology is deception. On the other, uh, on the other technologies of... Um, of surveillance. So there's a constant technology race there. New opportunities also rising with the Internet of Things and ransomware. It's one thing when the Internet of Things is just your fridge. It's another when it controls your heating and it's the middle of winter and it's cut off by a cyber, by, by a cyber gang who won't turn your heating back on until you've paid them. Right? And I think that's where we're going with the Internet of Things. Trend five Refugees, migrants, I would argue the growth business of the 21st century, Tuesday, Ratana, with Tuesday. She's done some great, work on, some great work on this. And my view is we ain't seen nothing yet, Ronald Reagan's famous catchphrase, right? Climate change migration is going to be huge. Political collapse in Egypt, think about that. You've got 10 times the population of Syria. So what would that look like? And groups do arise to meet the need. And I think we, we, we castigate human smugglers, but essentially they are informal transportation companies and informal travel agents, many of them anyway. The problem is, in an illicit market, there is often, and again, I'd give like, Federico's views on this, but there is often no quality control. And that's, that's the issue, right? So this is why we've had all, this, all the deaths we have in the Mediterranean, because people paid up front, these, the, the, the smugglers, and they don't care whether the boat makes it or not. Set. Trend six, criminal organizations as instruments of state policy. We've seen this with Putin. We've seen it with Pakistan, the D company. And they've given him a safe, Pakistan has given Dawood Ibrahim a safe haven. It became too hot for him in Dubai. So he now lives in Karachi, has two homes in Karachi. The 
The Pakistani likes to claim he's still in Dubai, but he's not. Uh, North Korea was involved back in the 90s. North Korea was big time organized crime with diplomatic, dip, diplomatic, with diplomats and consulates often being the criminals. Uh, they've moved into cybercrime. And they actually had this great, this incredible breach through Swift accounts in the bank, Bangladesh where they got 81 million. And that's better for them, right? Because they can have plausible deniability. Seventh, increase in diversity of structures. We have hierarchies, we have networks, we have hybrids. And I think different kinds of networks. I do a lecture where I do core networks, mesh networks, which is the core There's a central direction. Mesh, there are groups that come together and coordinate without hierarchy. Brokers are where they're key individuals. This is what the arms trade is like, where they're key individuals who have companies and often transportation companies that play a big part. And then flux networks in the Netherlands, it's two or three people coming together, breaking apart, and even Colombian groups are like that. Okay. Uh, the hybrids, the one we haven't given enough attention to is modular, and I think there was some talk about this, this there was some suggestion about this this morning, right? So Sinaloa has had groups that are responsible for part of the operation. They know nothing about what goes on before, nothing about what goes on after, and we haven't yet got a good handle on these modular, self-contained bits of the organizations along the supply chain. Next one is rise of hubs and super hubs. And this is something that very few people have talked about. Patrick Keefe has talked about it, Europol, and uh, Gordon, uh, who's, who's, a, who's a, an Australian. So there's some definitions. I think you can have logistic hubs, you can have concentration of crime hubs, or some places where both come together, and now you have what I'm like starting to call super hubs. Um, I would argue Turkey, and particularly its role in relation to the wars in the Middle East, but Turkey, Spain, where you have Russians fighting Irish criminals and a lot of others, uh, where gangs are also from, from Latin America, that, that's become a super hub. Thailand's a super hub, particularly the Bangkok, Pattaya uh, kind of corridor. Frozen conflict, they have the groups, but not necessarily the logistics, right, like Transnistria. Cities, I think Milan, and I think Federico's done some work on, on Milan showing how, how it basically I was very attractive. So groups migrated from the south of Italy to the north. But Karachi also. And Peter, Peter Lupsher also used to say port cities were often the hubs of organized crime. So the other one is state seeking sanctions. Peter Andreas done some great work on the criminalization consequence of sanctions. So one of the biggest organized crime groups in, in Iran now is the uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps because it's been involved in circumventing sanctions. And as Peter said, that leads to a criminalization of the society. Oops. Okay, we talked about this a lot already, but the rise of alternative governance. It's partly related to state weakness, partly related to what Will, Will Reno once talked about in terms of groups being both predatory and paternalistic, and then the balance becomes. But it's bottom up. A great example, my favorite, is the Lorenzanas in Guatemala, who were very paternalistic. I'd, I'd flood relief, I'd set up medical clinics, clinics, provided jobs, gifts at Christmas, did all sorts of things. Unlike the Mendozas, also in that region, in Pitan, who, who were very predatory and involved in a lot of land theft, and I think were responsible for a lot of the killings. So, the people are becoming, I'm glad Federico's more interested in this, because I think, I think James Cocaine has written on this, Van der Falba Brown recently. Um, in, in the quote I have there, and Desmond Arias, and Desmond's done some brilliant work, I think, on this. I actually, I, I've been trying to work out, for, particularly for Central America, typology of spaces, right? So I, are they peaceful, are they conflictual, and then I have state, non-state. And this is what I came up with first, formally governed or alternatively governed. And if you're at the conflict end of the spectrum, are you talking about confrontation between the state and non-state, or are you talking about contested spaces, and prisons can be Ben, Ben's talking about prisons, these are contested spaces in many cases. Um, but the state sometimes get Ill, gets involved as well, turns them into con so they become confrontational spaces between the state and non-state. That was, and then there's a space of flows that runs through all this. But that's a useful way of thinking about it, but it's not enough, right? So I mean, read Des Desmond Arias' last book and talked to someone I was doing some work on this for. We sat with his and we came up with three. So we added with another two dimensions, right? Mixed or hybrid spaces. And I think this is more realistic. And then layered conflicts, 
where you can have the state versus organized crime, but organized crime groups fighting each other. And then what's interesting for students of international relations, it comes, becomes very interesting. Do you bandwagon or do you balance? All those kind of questions that we've looked at in states become important in the criminal, in the criminal world as well. Trend 10 is a new book that I got a chapter in on ISIS with Colin Clark by Kim Thatchik and Rolly Lau called Terrorist Criminal Enterprises. Um, a lot of people have talked, I think, wrongly about collaboration between criminals and terrorists. That's not the issue. What's going on is terrorists engaging in do-it-yourself organized crime, right? I used that term about 15 years ago, and I think it's still correct. ISIS is the best example. But ISIS was AQI on steroids. It did nothing that AQI didn't do, but had a far greater territorial control. And that was critical. And it engaged in all these things, right? Taxation on the one side, because it was a proto-state, and extortion. And sometimes they were the same, sometimes they were different. But there was also trafficking of things that don't fit Frederick's, <laughs> Federico's, uh, don't fit Federico's typology, but I think they're important. And I, I'm hoping he will change his typology to incorporate them. Uh, and then other criminal organizations, very similar, right? Hezbollah's tax drug traffickers, like Czech Rehab. I mean, that was in Colombia. People said, well, they're working together. Uh, no, Hezbollah was demanding their cut, of the pro their cut of his proceeds. It was a tax. And AQM, everybody said, AQM is working with drug traffickers to take cocaine shipments through the Sahel. This is what it really was. Thank you very much for listening. Muy buenas tardes, sí. Eh, normalmente, cuando en Colombia hablo en español, pero dado que el panel eh, está más bien orientado al inglés, voy a hablar en inglés, si me permiten. Eh, I have four basic ideas that I want to present, um, trying to sort of summarize some of the elements that I think are dictating the direction of organized crime. Um, I start with a kind of um, footnote. For those of you who have read Charles Tilly, um, the famous uh, historian of uh, European state formation, he once argued, actually he's argued many times, that uh, states make war, wars make states. Well, I think if we adapt that, right, to our study of organized crime, of all sorts, that states determine the structure the dynamics and the opportunities that organized crime confront. States are fundamental in this process. And organized crime in turn shapes states and the ways that they structure themselves, the way that they function, the way they govern uh, the, ter the national territory, um, administer justice, and deliver public goods. And I think that's what all of this discussion is about. Um, about how it is that states affect organized crime and organized crime affects states. So I have sort of three general ideas that could take us, you know, literally months to go through. I will take only a few minutes. Um, the first, working off of uh, Phil's presentation, his mention of Peter Lupsha, I think that it's important for us to understand, and Peter was of course working from other sources, the division of mm, predatory, uh, parasitical, and symbiotic forms of organized crime. The predatory one is where groups start up and use violence, very often street violence, shootouts, um, brutality, um, to establish themselves in uh, the markets that they are seeking to dominate. The parasitical one is where they gain a foothold in some units or entities or agencies of the state. They could be the local police, they could be the intelligence groups, they could be segments of the army. Um, so the parasitical part is where they don't dominate the state, but they capture or at least infiltrate and control partially elements of the state. And the symbiotic one is where there is a fusion between organized crime and the state, or between state authority and organized crime, where there is no effective separation. 
Now, Peter Lepsha didn't develop this, this framework, and many others have begun to use it in various ways. I wanted to say a few things about it that I think help illuminate some of the trends that we are seeing in organized crime um, in the 21st century in Mexico, in Central America, in Colombia, and throughout the Western Hemisphere, to not go beyond the Western Hemisphere, but we certainly could. Uh, the first is that this, this paradigm that Peter Lepsha and many others have used is not lineal. At least in my opinion, it's not lineal. It doesn't go automatically from you know, the predatory through the parasitical to the symbiotic and sort of the end of history you know, is, is reached. Um, there is the real possibility of reversing these processes. If in fact you see um, symbiotic relationships in certain moments in time at a federal or national level, they can be reversed very often by external wars, <laughs> by interventions, right, from other states. We've seen this in a variety of contexts. I need not get into it because there's no time. Um, this is where CSEEC, right, may have some role to play. It's where the United States, where the European Union and others may have a role to play. It very often, right, I mean, if there is a symbiotic relationship at the federal or national level, very often takes external forces to break that symbiosis between organized crime and um, the state because it is so deeply entrenched. But I, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you can reverse it and there are a variety of conditions and a number of um, scholars have studied under what conditions that can be done. But you don't eliminate organized crime if you are in fact able to break the symbiotic relationship that exists uh, today in Venezuela or that exists today in Guatemala or in a number of other countries around the globe. Um, too many to list because you can push the organized crime into sub-national levels of organization. The same symbiotic relationship at the federal level can be established in specific states or departments or regions of a given country. And that creates all kinds of interesting, complex, and difficult dynamics. Even when the federal government, right, is supposedly opposed, you may well see in the state of Veracruz in Mexico, in the state of Michoacan in Mexico, in other parts of Mexico, this kind of symbiotic relationship, not at the federal level, but at the regional or, or, or state level. And of course, you can see the same kind of reversals. If um, Mexico is successful, which I don't believe they're going to be with the Mando Unico um, efforts to give governors greater control, you can still have clear symbiotic relationships at the municipal or local level. What this means, right, is that we have to analyze not states, not mafia states. I think that that's far too general a term most of the time. I think we have to look at subnational levels and see these dynamics, right? See how they alter the structure, dynamics, and opportunity, right? Uh, opportunities exist for organized crime. This implies, right, that there are very complex relationships between elements at various levels of the state and organized crime. It is clearly possible um, for the organized crime to establish at municipal levels, as they, as they have in many Latin American countries, uh, forms of symbiotic relationship which make getting to them difficult. Think of the Clan Usuga, the Urabeños, the, no, the uh, Gaitanistas, right? Or the uh, Cartel del Golfo here in Colombia. They control significant parts of this territory. Mm, the reason the federal government, right, the national government in Colombia has not been able to get Otoniel has a great deal to do with their territorial control. But it's not simply territorial control, it's also control over the local political structures and local economic structures in a particular sub-region of the country. We could proliferate these examples to many other, um, you know, parts of, of Latin America. The, this seems to me to be a, a fruitful area for f future uh, research, to take a look at the nature, not simply at a national level, which often gets you into these declarations that Colombia is a failed state, that Mexico is a failed state, that everybody is a failed state, that everybody is a failed state, perdón. Um, so I think that we could do a lot with all of that, looking carefully at the nature of 
national, subnational, and local relationships in order to understand under what conditions, for example, is it possible to establish relations that permit the state to coexist with organized crime or to enter into relationships of complicity with organized crime or to, in fact, establish certain forms of peace with organized crime, Pax Mafiosa, right? And all of these other things. It's not at the national level that it takes place, and we've got to study much more systematically these dynamics because the future of organized crime, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, and especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, is going to be at the local and the regional level, not necessarily at the national level, which attracts too much attention. Okay, there's a second set of ideas that I wanted to put forward in the time that I have. This has to do with the actual structure of organized crime. I think that we have seen significant evolution, right, in the business models that organized criminal groups have taken on, and there have been several references to it. I want to try to add my two cents to clarify a couple of the points, particularly the one that suggests that we are seeing reconsolidation of organized crime, uh, sort of a, the, 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 you know, the commonly used term cartel, right, of Medellin style or Cali or Sinaloa and others. I think that we've, we've seen significant evolution in the forms that organized crime take, specifically because of pressures from, from individual states within the region and from international authorities um, against the, the, the specific forms of organized crime that previously developed. I'm thinking here, and I'll, I'll do it quickly, of the corporatist, uh, corpor corporative form or the pyramidal form where it's hierarchical in nature. You have a CEO, somebody's in charge, right? And we, we've seen this kind of organization um, here in Colombia, certainly. Um, we've, you know, with the Cartel de Medellin, we've seen it in, in Mexico with uh, the Carrillo Fuentes family, the Arriano Felix family, Juarez and, and, and Tijuana, just to mention a few. And many of these organizations have proven pretty bad for business over time. That is, they're fairly easy to get at because of the hierarchical nature, the pyramidal nature. And this, of course, justified the kingpin strategy that we saw pursued by the United States and many others. They have evolved into military forms of organization through the Zetas, I need not explain that, but they used, of course, a hierarchical method. But you, you've all seen what's, what's happened to the Zetas. After the death of Heriberto Lascano Lascano in 2011, we've seen a deterioration in the Zetas, and they have actually adopted um, more of a franchise model, a more decentralized model, precisely because it was e easy to get at the military hierarchy. That also was a model that was relatively bad for business. It's not that we're never going to see signs of that kind of model before or of the corporate model, but I think that we have seen evolution towards um, what Phil mentioned as the hub and spoke model center of a wheel and then wheel with spokes going out. This is often called the horizontal model where you get, there is a center that organizes this and you have to pay tribute to it very often. Um, they do some enforcement, but they give great a great deal of autonomy to um, the spokes, to the organizations, right, that we see. This is certainly the model that um, El Chapo Guzman and El Mayo Zambada um, pursued with uh, uh, Sinaloa. It, we've also seen it, you know, increasingly here in Colombia. In fact, I think that we're seeing part of it with uh, the so-called Urabeño group. They have a family core. It was blood ties and all the rest of that. Then they have more autonomous groups. And then farther out, they have specialized groups. And I think that's the fourth model that we're seeing. We're seeing an evolution because of pressures from the state, because of international law enforcement, because of all kinds of, um, you know, sort of uh, trial and error processes where we have seen major kingpins go down, where we've seen organizations come and go. We are seeing a fourth level of evolution into uh, these more horizontal forms. Mm, I continue to call it hub and spoke, but the spokes are gaining greater autonomy. And there are two or three new dimensions. And Phil was mentioning a few of them. I think that the, the first, right, is that we're seeing mm, the introduction of networks, mesh, all the rest of these terms are often used, that is networks of specialists who are in charge of money laundering, who are in charge of uh, obtaining the chemical inputs that are necessary for processing, that are in charge of shipping the drugs, getting it into the United States, or in charge of laundering the money, 
or of providing arms. These are specialist groups that are not part of the inner circle, not part of the hub. In fact, they don't need to be. Um, it's better if they do not have the information about the other parts of the organization. That evolution, which is a fourth level, right, seems to me to be the trend that we're seeing, and you can bank on it. That's why we talk about the web, dark money, why we talk about Bitcoin, why we talk about all the rest of these things, because we are seeing this fourth type of evolution towards decentralization, specialization, the use of networks that are not directly forming part of the family. Um, I think that this is going to continue and in fact grow in a variety of ways, but I have a couple of caveats. I think that the hub, very often the uh, clan Usuga, for example, does not want to lose control. Some of you who know um, something about Buenaventura in, in this country um, know perfectly well that the clan Usuga finally sent sicarios to knock off people that were actually working for them who had failed to perform properly <laughs> their role and became too brutal, too bloody, and attracted too much attention. So they sent hitmen from the hub to the periphery to take out groups that had failed to perform properly. That means that there is a fifth level of evolution in which the hub tries to reassert under certain circumstances through the use of brutality and violence, control, over the spokes and over the more autonomous groups, particularly if they violate faith. Okay, third major point, and I'll do this quickly. We often talk about territorial control, control of territories, control of routes. I think we have to increasingly talk about a combined form of control. It's not just territory. Um, it is political control, but it's not control in an ideological sense that they want to establish a, a religious, uh, theocracy that they want, as ISIS and others apparently do. It's not that they want to carry out a revolution, right, as the FARC at least protested that it wanted to do for some time. They seek both territorial and political control because it is self-interest. It is a rational choice. They are looking to protect their source of income, their source of wealth, their ill-gotten gains, including land, right, that was Ill Ill illegally obtained and they do not want to return, hence their resistance, right, particularly at the local and departmental level to many of the aspects of the Acuerdo de Paz signed by Santos and the FARC. Under these circumstances, I think that we're seeing an evolution move towards political control. This all, for me, comes to a final conclusion, right, which is organized crime is adaptable, it's more adaptable than the state. It's more adaptable than international entities. They have incentives to do so. We've seen this evolution. We've seen generations of change. One couple, more or less, right? Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that Pablo Escobar is not with us or that um, El Chapo was extradited to the United States. These forms of organization are gonna to continue to evolve because the incentives are there. Because of the, Ill, the illicit gains, particularly in drug trafficking. So it is my conclusion, after years of looking at all of this, that we really have to start to change our paradigm here. We have to seriously think about alternative ways of looking at this to get the money out of the organized criminal dimensions of drug trafficking. We have to think seriously, not just about legalization of marijuana, but about the decriminalization of heroic drugs, especially when they are not involved in um, violent crimes. This does not mean that we are going to eliminate from one day to the next all forms of organized crime, which many people protest about. But I say, get rid of the major source of income you will reduce, right, the inertia behind the locomotive that is driving so much of the penetration of, of states, so much of the limitations, right, on the, their ability to govern, to uh, administer justice, or to deliver public goods, so much of the corruption. And unless we get serious about this, we can continue to think, right, about the next hundred years, very much as we have about the last hundred years, of a basically failed war against organized crime. Thank you. Eh, nos queda la presentación de Jerry McDermott eh, sobre, pues, se titula Razones del pesimismo del 2019. Eh, ya lo presentamos y todos lo conocen. Es el director y cofundador de Inside Crime. 
eh, y es ex oficial del ejército británico y ex corresponsal veterano eh, de periodismo investigativo de varios medios de gran importancia de Inglaterra. Eh, y para no comer más tiempo de lo que nos queda, voy a darle la palabra de una vez para que nos haga su presentación. Thank you. Um, mi presentación, por favor. Um, I've got to speak English, I'm told, because everybody else is speaking English, and for the streaming, um, it's got to be in one language. So um, I'm going to speak English. Uh, I'm often told that I'm a terrible pessimist, um, and I think this is probably the natural result of, of working uh, and dedicating your life to studying organized crime. There's, there's, there's seldom a sunny side to the story. Um, I am extremely pessimistic about 2019. Uh, and organized crime, transnational organized crime in Latin America. Uh, and I'm going to give you five reasons because we journalists love to make lists, okay? Reason number one, let me see if I can make this work. Okay, I can't. Um, which is, um, organized crime is by its nature, transnational organized crime is obviously transnational and therefore we must have a transnational response if we hope to be able to contain it. Um, and at the moment, we have probably the least unified or transnational response um, that we've had in the 20 years I've been here in, in Latin America. Um, in no small part, this is thank to, thanks to President Trump, um, who uh, love or hate the Americans, and you know the gringos don't have a great reputation in Latin America, they have always tried to think strategically about organized crime, mainly the organized crime that is threatened in the United States with drug trafficking and migration. Uh, and they have sought to promote and push regional responses to those crimes. Uh, and they've given a lot of aid um, to, to um, to reinforce the fight against those crimes and others. Obviously, that doesn't happen now. Um, we don't seem to have a transnational strategy. Um, President Trump has managed to offend his two most important uh, Latin American partners, uh, Mexico, which is apparently full of rapists, and Colombia, which apparently should be decertified in the war on drugs, despite having um, been fighting in the front line for the last 30 years. Um, But it's not just him. The European Union is extremely distracted. With Brexit, um, its priorities are migration and Islamic terrorism. Uh, so while there is an important um, uh, European Union uh, presence and effort in places like Bolivia, the European Union has not been able to step up and fill the hole left by uh, United States uh, presence. The OAS has never been a strong organization, although they are hammering away at Venezuela um, pretty relentlessly. Um, I do not see this improving in 2019. On the contrary, now that the Democrats have got the, the, the House, um, I suspect President Trump is going to get very much more bogged down in internal politics and will spend even less time on strategic thinking and foreign policy. So that's going to get worse. Number two. Okay. You got it. Okay. Um, tried and failed responses by national governments. What distresses me is that we seem condemned to repeat the same actions year after year. And I've put the three leaders there from the three most important organized crime nations. Um, Ivan Duque, who was elected very much on the basis of changing and improving the security dynamic, which was seen to weaken uh, in the last years of President Santos, mainly because of the great increase in, in coca, in coca and cocaine production. Um, He's been in 100 days. We haven't yet seen anything that suggests there's going to be any major change to the strategic dynamic. On the contrary, um, it's more of the same, but even less of that, because I see the implementation 
which was very much um, lacking under President Santos, now lacking even more, and we'll come back to the, the criminal implications of that. Um, our friend in Brazil, um, it's still too early to, to, to judge him, he hasn't taken office, but the discourse is very much mano dura, iron fist, you know, let's get out there, uh, if people have to be executed, then boo-hoo. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to fill up the prisons again, which the PCC are going to love. Um, uh, and then we've got AMLO in Mexico, who's already seemingly backtracking, even though he hasn't taken power. He's already backtracking on some of the, the, the crucial changes that he proposed um, in the war against organized crime, one of which was to demilitarize the fight. And he's now promised to recruit another 50,000 soldiers. So, you know, I, I, I feel that... Um, we're on this, uh, on the, you know, the rat in the lab, we're running around the wheel um, using exactly the same tactics that have brought us to this point and which are going to get worse for another three reasons uh, in Latin America next year. Next, please. Corruption. What has happened? Um, I actually I had a list of active or former presidents whose picture I could have put up. We'd have been on about 12 slides, um, because there is not really a nation uh, that has escaped wholly from this very highest level corruption. Um, and this, uh, uh, this presents us with a series of challenges in the fight against organized crime. One, state legitimacy. You know, that is forever being evaporated. And the latest polls talking about faith in democracy in Latin America are desperately depressing. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about governments shaping organized crime and organized crime shaping governments. And many of the speakers are, have, have addressed this extremely eloquently. I would say strong governments with clear strategies and policies against organized crime shape organized crime. They often fragment organized crime, they make it become more clandestine, and they make it a more risky enterprise. Whereas weak governments get shaped by organized crime. And that is what we have in so many parts of Latin America. And the growth of the, PP, the, the PCC in Brazil, you cannot understand without the utter chaos in the political sphere of, uh, in Brazil, where organized crime dropped off the, the, the political agenda simply because Temer was fighting for, for, for his political life. Um, next. Uh, as has been mentioned again by other, other um, panelists, the competitive advantage that organized crime has is that it's extremely agile. It can adapt to any change in market, political, or social conditions, literally um, uh, spinning on a dime. Whereas, of course, the, the titanics of government uh, find it very hard to even slightly change direction, let alone uh, make a radical adjustment to changing conditions. Um, what's been mentioned, and Steve picked it up in, 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 his, in his thing, the re composition of organized crime. Now, what we've seen uh, inside crime over the last 10 years is we've seen this almost continual fragmentation of organized crime in Latin America. And there haven't been that many exceptions to the rule. Um, Colombia has been pioneering this. Um, the Mexicans seem to be kind of five years behind. Um, but this year, we suddenly took a step back and we go, Look at Jalisco in Mexico. These guys are, are in the Mexican government's face. They are not making any attempt to, to slide under the radar. Look at the PCC. They're not only all over Brazil, they're in Paraguay, they're in Bolivia. Um, they're massacring, uh, carrying out massacres in, in the north of, of Brazil to open up the Colombian route. You know, these guys are also not shy. Um, can we go to the next one? Uh, uh, Bruce has, um, uh, has spoken a lot about, you know, what do the structures look like and, and all, the, all the participants are, 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 have come up with different, um, different models to understand this. We see the Colombians as the most sophisticated in the sense that these are the guys that have 
have suffered the greatest security force pressure over the last four decades. I mean, it's been pretty relentless. Not just Colombia, but obviously the United States had a huge role here. And the model that we've seen here is um, what we're calling the birth of the invisibles, which is your greatest protection as a drug trafficker or a senior mafia figure is not a private army, it's being anonymous. And this has led to a subcontracting model. And you talked about specialist units, you know. Um, most of the, uh, we've divided the Colombian criminal scene into three layers. Layer one is like your, your criminal labor pool, which can include specialist units like people that mount laboratories. Um, uh, but it's often uh, street gangs or low-level criminal structures that will carry out tasks, be they killings, be they protection of a site, be they... The second level are the major territorial actors that still work on the model of territoriality. They may control coca crops, they may control movement corridors, they may control departure points. And then in the middle, you've got the high-level drug traffickers who can no longer hide amongst the civil conflict in Colombia. So they can't be AUC commanders anymore or they can't be in bed with a, with a FARC commander. So they have now disappeared and it's all about subcontracting and the, the only way to fight this is to go after the brokers that link all the different, the, 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 the different elements on nodes in the network. However, the PCC isn't playing like this. Jalisco is not playing like this. The ELN in Colombia, which is increasing enormously its participation in criminal economies, is obviously still following a traditional militia guerrilla model. Um, so for 2019, one of my prognoses is if there's no state pressure, then organized crime doesn't need to box clever. Organized crime can reorganize in hierarchic structures, which are better to impose discipline in the underworld. They can become the scariest guy on the block because organized crime networks like to have a fear factor to assure that business runs smoothly. Um, so watch this space. Are we going to see a continuing fragmentation, which has been the pattern over the last decade, or are we going to see a recomposition? My fear is we're going for recomposition and a lot more platter rather than plomo. More bribery than violence. Next, please. Number five, the last one. I'm almost out of here. Um, booming criminal economies. We've already mentioned, you know, Colombia is producing more cocaine than ever before. Um, and Peru and Bolivia are not exactly cutting back their production. So we are at levels now that, according to the supply and demand market that, that, An that Angelica mentioned, we should be seeing markets being saturated. We should see purity levels going through the roof and we should see prices falling through the floor. We're not. Why are we not? Because in the drug business, the Colombians particularly have diversified their markets and they are aggressively expanding into places which never had a cocaine issue. And for us, what we're looking at very closely is China. Now, you only need 0.02% of the Chinese population to have the greatest cocaine market on the planet. Um, and the Chinese do seem to be embracing consumerism. Um, our contacts in the, in the, in the office in Envigado will tell us that there is there's so many containers going into China that they literally don't even have to hide the drugs. Um, the only thing is that the Colombians can't operate in China, but there are a thing, of course, called the triads, the oldest organized crime structures on the planet, um, that are more than happy to take it off their hands. So what we're seeing is this diversification of markets, which is keeping the price relatively high, which means the earnings from cocaine are astronomical. Now, it's not just cocaine. We've got, um, Steve's talked about the, the opioid crisis, uh, claiming an enormous number of, of victims, and it is also phenomenally lucrative. Um, gold, phenomenally lucrative. Um, human trafficking, thanks to our, our migration crises, prostitution, extortion is through the roof. Basically, everywhere you look in Latin America, the criminal economies are on the up. 
Any business that receives incremental increases in its income year on year is going to strengthen its military capacity, its power of corruption, and its sophistication. Which, again, is another pessimistic note uh, upon which we enter 2019. And I think, are we done? Uh, yeah, we can leave that. That's it, we're done. Thank you very much, enjoy 2019. <laughs> Um, es la una de la tarde. Yo quisiera proponer que, salvo que hubiera unas preguntas muy urgentes, eh, cerráramos aquí y guardaran las preguntas para las sesiones pequeñas. Pero si hay alguna necesidad urgente de hacer una pregunta, pues eh, los hemos tenido aquí cuatro horas. Y, sí. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for the microphone, and thank you very much, gentlemen, for three very interesting, very thought-provoking, and broad-reaching presentations. There was one thing that, it's half a question, half an observation, and I very much appreciate your reflections back, which is, I think we've seen a lot of, perhaps a divergence here in organized crime, a divergence between where the profits go and who they go to, and the manifestations of organized crime in terms of a lot of the violence and the conflicts which you've described. We did a study recently that was launched that looked at the profits earned in criminal activity in conflict zones, found that there are you know, extraordinarily high levels of conflict, but only, say, 4% of the money being earned was going to local conflict actors. But all of our attention goes to those because they're violent. A study we're doing with Insight Crime, in fact, on the extortion economy showed the same, that the money earned to the local level extortionists in Central America is barely a livelihood that they would earn as a legitimate agricultural worker, but they are the highest turnover in terms of deaths, in terms of violence. So I was wondering if you, you would, because none of you really mentioned the corporatization of organized crime and the fact that, though Jeremy and his invisible say that more and more the profits of organized crime go to people who look like us, who have white collars, nice jobs, nice houses, nice offices, and perhaps what are some of those consequences for the way that the criminal trajectory will play out? Okay. Does anyone want to answer that? Are we just going to ignore Tuesday? We're just going to ignore you, Tuesday. Yeah. Why not? I know. Bruce is going to say something. Very quickly. Um, listen, you're absolutely right. Always on the lowest level of, um, you know, the eslabón or the, uh, the ladder are the ones that receive the least, whether it's a peasant grower of coca leaf, right, or anybody else, a fighter right out in, in the campo. In that sense, there is fundamental inequality in organized crime as well. Not just in Colombian society, which is one of the most unequal, right? Along with Mexico and Brazil. So yes, the answer that you say, you're absolutely correct in your description. I think this is going to be perpetuated in great part because of what all of us are talking about in slightly different vocabularies, but essentially the same idea, which is that increasingly, particularly at the local and at the regional level, if not necessarily at the national level, Governments are protecting organized crime, and they are reaping the benefits from organized crime. That kind of political criminal nexus allows even further concentration of the illicit profits and a further marginalization of those at the lowest rate, rungs of the ladder. I, th I think it's also about supply chain, right? As you go further on, and I think this was one, one of... Federico's key point, as you go further on in the supply chain near to, nearer to the final market, that's where the money, that's where the money is really made. So, but I think it's a great observation. Um, and it, it's interesting the violence is, is there. Um, and you see, you see what, one, one place you see this is in the, the stolen antiquities market, right? Where all the violence is early on, but it's, it's using the violence as a cover. And then Sotheby's and... Uh, Christie's do not necessarily always do due diligence on the objects they sell. 
Ok, creo que vamos a dar cierre a esta sesión. Eh, agradecemos muchísimo a Bruce, Jerry y Phil participar. Quisiera llamar la atención a la pantalla. Las mesas de trabajo eh, comenzarán un poco después de las dos. Yo creo que vamos a terminarlas a las tres y media, no a las cuatro, para facilitar la salida del centro. Y simplemente para quienes no conozcan el claustro, eh, eh, el, la entrada al claustro está ubicado al otro lado del eje ambiental, es decir, salen de esta puerta, van a mano izquierda, pasan la estación de Transmilenio y ahí en la plaza ven la entrada. Todas las sesiones van a ser en la Torre 1, eh, que es menos ruidosa y nos han pedido reubicarnos ahí. Eh, habrá personas a la entrada del claustro para señalarles eh, eh, en dónde queda la Torre 1 eh, y hemos enviado un email a todos quienes se inscribieron en cada una de las mesas para que sepan de este cambio. Entonces, esperamos que algunos de ustedes, una de las buenas noticias es que no habrá que esperar a almorzar porque la mayoría de los lugares de almuerzo por acá pues no tendrán estudiantes, entonces el almuerzo podrá ser facilitado por esto. Eh, muchas gracias.